So I want to ask a, a little bit about some of the new investing things going on in the markets. And Greg Wondra from Bakersfield wonders about um, target date funds. And I wanted to also ask about all the new index funds with a brain. Are those things really adding value? No, probably not. Uh, uh, the the S and P five hundred index fund is the one to use. That's the one I used in that bet I made for ten years. It's the one I've told uh, the trustee for my wife uh, to put ninety percent of the funds I leave her into. Uh, now, uh, the S and P five hundred is I don't know whether it's eighty percent of the market value of you know of everything you can buy in this country, and uh, uh, it's over. I think it's over twenty trillion. Uh, uh, and you're buying America. And let me give you a figure that'll blow your mind, I think. I bought my first stock when I was 11 years old. It was the first quarter of 1942, shortly after Pearl Harbor. I spent $114.75, three, three shares, 114.75. If I put that 114 into the S&P 500 at that time and reinvested the dividends, Think of a figure as to what it might be, would be worth today. Oh man! Well, it's okay. You know, just tell me. I, I just want right. your audience to think okay. for a second. Okay. The Pause. answer, okay. the answer is about four hundred thousand oh. dollars. So if I, as a little kid, had taken that hundred fourteen bucks, I'd save a shoveling snow or whatever. I'd done four hundred thousand dollars today, one person's lifetime. That's America. I mean, that isn't me. You know, it, it's it is the huge tailwind the American economy gives to any equity investor. Now, the market's gone down many times during that time. People have panicked during that time. Headlines have been terrible. You know, it looked like we were losing the war when we first bought it. But America is a powerful economic machine that since 1776 has worked and it's going to keep working now. You don't want to buy to hold for a year. You don't want to buy with the idea that you could sell it in two years or three years necessarily make money. You may you could lose money that way. But if you buy it for 10, 20, just keep buying the S&P 500 index and forget about all the other nonsense that's being sold to you because I'll guarantee you one thing about the stuff being sold to you, it will carry bigger fees than what I'm talking about. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and there's no reason to think that you're not, we you don't know if it's 400,000, but that same sort of process or returns won't happen starting right now. The S&P 500 companies have earned well over 10% on equity, often 15% annually for years and years and years and years. They've done it with Democratic administrations, with Republican administrations. Now, you get money compounding at that kind of rate underlying your investment and you get a diversified group of that, I mean, you're going to do well. People say you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing and it's totally true and the reason is, uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it and you don't really love it, uh, you're going to give up. And that's what happens to most people, actually. If you really look at, 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 at the ones that uh, ended up you know, being successful, unquote, in the eyes of society and the ones that didn't, oftentimes it, it's the ones that are successful loved what they did so they could persevere when, you know, when it got really tough. And, and the ones that, that didn't love it quit because they're sane, right? Who would want to put up with this stuff if you don't love it? So it's a lot of hard work and, and it's a lot of worrying constantly. And... Uh, um, if you don't love it, you're gonna fail. So you gotta love it, you gotta have passion. And I think that's the high order bit. The second thing is, um, you've, gotta be, you've gotta be a really good talent scout. Because no matter how smart you are, uh, you need a team of great people. And you've gotta figure out how to, how to size people up fairly quickly, make decisions without knowing people too well, and hire them and you know, see how you do and refine your intuition and be able to, to help you know, build an organization that can eventually just, you know, build itself, because um, you need great people around you. Thank you. This is the seminar at the Graduate School of Business at Columbia University. After all, it's older than the stock exchange. And we thought professors familiar with the language of the street might treat the market with detachment. Dean Courtney Brown and Professor Benjamin Graham 
were instructing future brokers and customers' men. The explanation cannot be found in any mathematics, but it has to be found in investor psychology. You can have an extraordinary difference in the price level merely because not only speculators, but investors themselves are looking at the situation through rose-colored glasses rather than dark blue, dark blue glasses. It may well be true that the underlying psychology of the American people has not changed so much, and that what the American people have been waiting for for many years has been an excuse for going back to the speculative attitudes which used to characterize them from time to time. If history counts for anything, that uh, the stock market is much more likely than not to advance to a point where a real danger This question concerns the so-called Wall Street professional. Are Wall Street professionals usually more accurate in their near or long-term market trends, forecasts of stock market trends? If not, why not? Well, we've been following that uh, interesting question for a generation or more. And I must say frankly that our studies indicate that you have your choice between tossing coins and taking the consensus of expert opinion. And the results are just about the same in each case. Your question as to why uh, they are not more dependable is a very good one and an interesting one. And my own explanation for that is this, that everybody in Wall Street is so smart see, that their brilliance offsets each other. <laughs> and that whatever they know is already reflected in the level of stock prices pretty much. And consequently, what happens in the future represents what they don't know. I think the public can do extremely well in the stock market on their own. I think the fact that institutions dominate the market today is a positive for small investors. These institutions push stocks on usual lows, they push them on usual highs. For someone that can sit back and have their own opinion, know something about the industry, this is a positive. <coughs> it's not a negative. So that's what I want to talk about. And the single, single most important thing to me in the stock market for anyone is to know what you own. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. They, they would not be able to tell you why they own it. They couldn't say in a minute or less why they own it. Actually, if you really press them down, they'd say the reason I own this is the sucker's going up. I mean, that's the only reason. <laughs> that's the only reason they own it. And if you can't explain, I'm serious, you can't explain to a 10-year-old in two minutes or less why you own a stock, you shouldn't own it. And that's true, I think, about 80% of people that own stocks. And this is the kind of stock people like to own. This is the kind of company people adore owning. It's a relatively simple company. They make a, a very uh, narrow, easy to understand product. They make a one megabit SRAM, CMOS, bipolar risk, floating point, data IO, IO array processor, with an optimizing compiler, a 16 dual port memory, a double diffused metal oxide semiconductor monolithic logic chip with a plasma matrix vacuum fluorescent display. It has a 16 bit dual memory, it has a Unix operating system, four whetstone megaflop polysilicone emitter, a high bandwidth, that's very important, six gigahertz, <laughs> double metallization communication protocol, an asynchronous backward compatibility, peripheral bus architecture, four wave interleave memory, a token ring and change backplane, and it does it in 15 nanoseconds of capability. Now, if you own a piece of crap like that, <laughs> you will never make money. Never. Somebody will come along with more whetstones or less whetstones or a bigger mega flop or a smaller mega flop. You won't have the foggiest idea what's happened. And people buy this junk all the time. I made money in Dunkin' Donuts. I can understand it. I, uh, when there was recessions, I didn't have to worry about what was happening. I could go there and people were still there. I didn't have to worry about low-priced Korean imports. I mean, I just didn't have, you know, I can understand it. And you laugh. I made 10 or 15 times my money in Dunkin' Donuts. Those are the kind of stocks I can understand. If you don't understand it, it doesn't work. This is the single biggest principle. And it bothers me that people are very careful in their money. The public, when they buy a refrigerator, they get a consumer report, so they buy a microwave oven, they do that. They ask people what's the best kind of radar range or, they, or what kind of car to buy. They do research on apartments, when they go to when they go on a trip to Wyoming, they get the mobile travel guide, or California, when they go to Europe, they get the Michelin travel guide. People will hear a tip on a bus on some stock, and they'll put half their life savings in it before sunset, and they wonder why they lose money in the stock market. 
And when they lose money, they blame it on the institutions that program trading. That is garbage. They didn't do any research. They bought a piece of junk. They didn't look at the balance sheet. And that's what you get for it. And that's what we were being driven to. And it's self-fulfilling. The public does terrible investing, and they, they say they don't have a chance. It's because that's the, way they're, that's the way they're acting. I'm trying to convince people there is a method. There are reasons for stocks that go up. Uh, Coca-Cola, this is very magic. It's a very magic number. Easy to remember. Coca-Cola is earning 30 times per share what they did 32 years ago. The stock has gone up 30-fold. Bethlehem Steel is earning less than they did 30 years ago. The stock is half its price of 30 years ago. Stocks are not lottery tickets. There's a company behind every stock. If a company does well, the stock does well. It's not that complicated. People get too carried away. And first of all, they try and predict the stock market. That is a total waste of time. No one can predict the stock market. They try to predict interest rates. I mean, this is a, if anybody would predict interest rates right three times in a row, they'd be a billionaire. Considering there's not that many billionaires on the planet, it's very, you know, I took, I had logic, so I had a syllogism and uh, studied these when I was at Boston College. There can't be that many people who can predict interest rates because there'd be lots of billionaires. And no one can predict the economy. I had a lot of people in this room were around in 1981 and 82 when we had a 20% prime rate with double digit inflation, double digit, digit uh, unemployment. I don't remember anybody telling me in 1981 about it. I didn't read, I studied all this stuff. I don't remember anybody telling me we're going to have the worst recession since the Depression. So, what I'm trying to tell you, it'd be very useful to know what the stock market is going to do. It'd be terrific to know that the Dow Jones average year from now would be X, that we're going to have a full scale recession, or interest rates going to be 12%. That's useful stuff. You never know it though. You just don't get to learn it. So I've always said, if you spend 14 minutes a year on economics, you've wasted 12 minutes. And I, I, I really believe that. Now, I have to be, I have to be fair. I'm talking about economics on the broad scale, predicting the downturn for next year, or the upturn, or M1 and M2, 3B, and all these, all these Ms. The, uh, I'm talking about economics, to me, is when you talk about scrap prices. When I own auto stocks, I want to know what's happening to used car prices. When used car prices are going up, it's a very good indicator. When I own hotel stocks, I want to know hotel occupancies. When I own chemical stocks, I want to know what's happening to the price of ethylene. These are facts. If aluminum inventories go down five straight months, that's relevant. I can deal with that. Home affordability, I want to know about it. When I own uh, Fannie Mae or I own a housing stock. These are facts. You can, they're economic facts and it's economic predictions. And economic predictions are a total waste. And uh, interest rates, Alan Greenspan's a very honest guy. He would tell you that he can't predict interest rates. He can tell you what short rates are going to do in the next six months. Try and stick them on what the long-term rate will be three years from now. They'll say, I don't have any idea. So how are you, the investor, supposed to predict interest rates if the head of the Federal Reserve can't do it? So I think that's, uh, but you should study history, and history is the important thing you learn from. What you learn from history is the market goes down. It goes down a lot. The math is simple, there's been 93 years a century. This is easy to do. The market's had 50 declines of 10% or more. So 50 declines in 93 years, but once every two years, the market falls 10%. We call that a correction. That means, that's a euphemism for losing a lot of money rapidly. But we, you know, we call it a correction. And uh, uh, so 50 declines in 93 years, about once every two years, the market falls 10%. Of those 50 declines, 15 have been 25% or more. That's known as a bear market. We've had 15 declines in 93 years. So every six years, the market's going to have a 25% decline. That's all you need to know. You need to know the market's going to go down sometime. If you're not ready for that, you shouldn't own stocks. And it's good when it happens. If you like a stock at 14 and it goes to 6, that's great. You understand the company, you look at the balance sheet, and they're doing fine. And you're hoping to get to 22 with it. 14 to 22 is terrific. 6 to 22 is exceptional. So you take advantage of these declines. They're going to happen. No one knows when they're going to happen. It would be very, people tell you about it after the fact that they predicted it, but they predicted it 53 times. And uh, so you can take advantage of the volatility in the market if you understand what you own. Uh, so I think that's the key to element. Another key element is that you have plenty of time. People are in an unbelievable rush to buy a stock. I'll give an example of a well-known company. Walmart went public in October of 1970. 1970 went public. Already had a great record. It had 
15 years performance, great balance sheet. You could have waited 10 years saying you're a very conservative investor, you're not sure this Walmart can make it. You want to check, you're, you're, you see them operate in small towns, you're afraid they can only make it in seven or eight states, you want to wait till they go to more states, you keep waiting. You could have bought Walmart 10 years after they went public and made 35 times your money. If you bought it when they went public, you would have made 500 times your money, but you could have waited 10 years after Walmart went public and made uh, 30, over 30 times your money. You could wait three years after Microsoft went public and made 10 times your money. Now, if you knew something about software, I know nothing about software. If you knew something about software, you would have said, these guys have it. I don't care who's going to win Compaq, IBM. I don't know who's going to win Japanese computers. I know Microsoft, MS-DOS is the right thing. You could have bought Microsoft. Again, I'm repeating myself, stocks are not a lottery ticket. There's a company behind every stock. And you, you can just watch it. You have plenty of time. People are in an amazing rush to purchase the security. They're out of breath when they call up. You don't need to do this. It's, uh, the, uh, you need an edge to make money, too. People have incredible edges, and they throw them away. I'll give you a quick example of uh, Smith Klein. This is a stock that, that had Tagamet. Now, you didn't have to buy Smith Klein when Tagamet was doing clinical trials. You didn't have to buy Smith Klein when Tagamet was talked about in the New England Journal of Medicine or the British version, Lancet. You could have bought SmithKline when Tagamet first came out, a year after it came out. Let's say your spouse, your mother, your father, you were a nurse, you were a druggist, you're writing all these prescriptions. Tagamet was doing an amazing job of curing ulcers, and it was a wonderful pill for the company because if you just stopped taking it, the ulcer came back. See, it wasn't it would have been a crummy product that you took it for a buck and it went away. But it was a great product for the company. But you could have bought it two years after the product was on the market and made five or six times your money. I mean, all the druggists, all the nurses, all the people, millions of people saw this product. And they're out buying oil companies, you know, or drilling rooms, you know. It happens. And then three years later or four years later, Glaxo, even a bigger company, it's a huge company, a British company, brought out Zantac, which was a better, at that time, an improved product. And you could have seen that take market share do well. You could have bought Glaxo and tripled your money. So you only need a few stocks in your lifetime. You are clearly one of the world's most successful technology investors and one of the world's most successful businessmen. Let me start by asking you about a fund that you are now raising, the Vision Fund. It's supposed to be a fund of $100 billion? Yes. Now that would be the biggest fund ever raised. So when you told people you were going to raise a $100 billion fund, did they tell you you were a little crazy? Well, some people said. You had a meeting with a man who was the Deputy Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, who's now the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. And as I understand the story, you went in and in one hour you convinced him to invest $45 billion. No, no, it's not true. Okay. <laughs> 45 minutes, $45 billion. Okay, sorry. Okay, I apologize. In other words, so if you had had... One, one, mi one, one billion dollars per minute. <laughs> what could you have said that was that persuasion to get $45 billion in one meeting? Well, actually, uh, I said, you came to Tokyo as the first time. I want to I wanna give you a gift. I want to give you a, a massa gift, the Tokyo gift, a trillion dollar gift. And he opened up his eyes and said, okay, <laughs> now it's interesting. All right. <laughs> so I woke up him and said, here is how we can give you a I can give you a trillion dollar gift. You invest hundred billion dollars to my fund, I give you a trillion dollars. But what is it that you told people? What was the vision that you actually gave them? So, one vision, which is singularity. Singularity is the concept that the computing power, comp computers, artificial intelligence, surpass uh, mankind's brains. The singularity is the concept. The word means that is the point at which a computer becomes smarter than a human brain. Yes. Today already computer is smarter than mankind for chess or go or weather forecast. To some expert systems computer is already smarter but in 30 years most of the subject that we are thinking they will be smarter than us. That's my video.
And so you said in the beginning you didn't want to form a company. In fact, you went out of your way to not make it that. You wanted to control the growth. When did that change? Well, eventually what, what I realized, once we started getting a bunch of really smart people together, that a company is really- a lot more year? Yeah, I mean, it started off with my roommates, right? And then, and then a few other people. Um, it, uh, it occurred to me that, that building a company was the best way to align a group of people towards building something great, right? And, um, and it's really just, it's, it's a good organizational structure where, um, where you can really reward people if they're building something that's good. You can work with partners and, and reward them if the products that you're developing work well. Um, so it's just a, it's a good way to get the best people involved to build something very good. And where'd you think of that? I mean, I, again, take myself back to sophomore year, and I may have been mm -hmm. retarded in a lot of ways relative to you, but so where does this idea of, of building a company come from? Sophomore year in college, were people like suggesting it to you on the outside? Had you always had this budding entrepreneurial fantasy? Um, I mean, where does it come from? Well, I mean, so so I built the first version of Facebook in, in a couple of weeks, which was it was it was pretty quick, right? And, and especially for the scale that it eventually w was operating at. I mean, I started it just I rented a server for eighty five dollars a month, and um, and on that we're basically doing I think millions of page views a day um, because you know we'd have you know, I think at some point like. 10 or 20 percent of all Harvard students were logged in at the same time. This was just in the first like week. So I mean, so there, there was a lot of, of stuff that went into building the first version, but but that was pretty quick. And um, then as it expanded, just got more and more smart people around me to join. Um, eventually, we moved out to California. Originally, when we went out there, we weren't expecting to move out there. We wanted to go out there for the summer because we had this feeling like, okay, all these great companies come from Silicon Valley. Wouldn't it be cool to spend a summer out there? Um, and get that experience, but we expected to go back to Harvard in the fall. And um, the thing that made it so that that we didn't was that Harvard has this great policy that lets you take as much time off as you want. So we decided, okay, let's go ahead and take one semester off and um, continue just building things out. And more people joined our team. Um, and at that point, we, we formally incorporated the company and um, got our investment from our first investor, Peter Thiel. And um, then things were just growing, and we, we got up to a million users within our first year of running the site. And then we decided, okay, let's take a second term off from Harvard. And um, then you know, just th things kept on growing. And then we got up to about five million users, and then we we're like, okay, let's take a whole year off. And then like, right, I guess we're not really going back. But I mean, it was never this big decision where it's like, okay, at this point I'm going to drop out of school and I'm going to start a company, and it's going to be this crazy thing. Uh, it just happened very gradually, and in each step we were just kind of doing what made sense to do next. next. question on gold, up 2.5% for oh. the first quarter. Uh, I know in the past you've seen it as a speculative bet. How do you see it today? I hate gold. Gold is a religion. There's, abs there's some, some fundamental value to gold, but everything else, it's, it's a collectible. I, I see gold and Bitcoin as being the same thing. Well, hate is a strong word. But, okay. So the miners, too. All of gold, the whole gold spectrum. Individually, as people, I've heard they're great people. But <laughs> as, a, as an investment, okay, you're right. Hate is not strong enough. Hate with extreme prejudice as wow, an investment. Oh, gosh. Okay, so Bitcoin and gold on the same <laughs> level for you. They're both collectibles. Okay. They're, they're, the value is based off of supply and demand. And the good news about Bitcoin is there's a finite supply that will ever be created. And the bad news about gold is they'll keep on mining more. Well, Goldman Sachs will say, says that we only have 20 years left of mineable gold. Well, then in 20 years, we could have another conversation. So, so you, don't see, you don't see gold as money then? Um, no, I do not see it as, as an alternative to currency. No, not at all. Let's put it this way. If I don't see people in, in Puerto Rico carrying around big bags of gold to try <laughs> to try to save things. Um, let's turn to, 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 to Facebook now, segue. Well, let, me, wait, let me say it one more time. Hate with extreme prejudice is not enough. Hate with double extreme prejudice with that oh, ounce of hot where, sauce. Where does this hate for gold come from? Like, did it do something to you in a No, just because I knew it was so important to you, okay. I know you. <laughs> do you feel the same about silver? Or is there any it's metal silver, you like, yeah. palladium, platinum? No, you I mean, I, I think, um, I, I don't know those others as well, but those are pretty much based off their intrinsic value as much as I can tell. So you're in the camp of gold is just a pet rock? Pretty much. Pretty much, all right. But I'd buy a pet rock first. <laughs> What do you think of the whole gold thing? Before we get into the whole virus, it is a little unusual. Are you buying what, what, what's happening here? Or it's just unusual, I'm not, a not unprecedented, but unusual. What do you think? Yeah, I'm not a gold fan at all. I think it's more of a religion than an investable asset, even though, I mean, historically, it's been a store of value. I just think, you know, this is the worst of the worst we've experienced in a long time. And you don't see gold setting record highs. You don't see people using to, you know, hoarding it or anything in case something really goes bad. I'm just not a fan.
when is it appropriate in your opinion for an individual to buy stocks? Is there a, a level of expertise or interest, a, an amount of time you should have or capital, or it should be a, a side frivolity in, in, in a base portfolio of index funds, et cetera? That, that last sentence captures it best, and that is you should have a serious money account. I might even call it a boring money account where you put money in the stock market index fund and balance it out a little bit with some bonds, depending on age and so on. And don't look at it. Don't look at it for 50 years. Don't peak. But when you retire, open the envelope. Be sure a doctor is nearby to revive you. <laughs> <laughs> You'll go into a dead faint. You can't believe there's that much money in the world. And that's where we fool ourselves. So that's a serious money, boring money account. We have a gambling culture here in this country. Maybe every country does. You see it in its finest manifestation, or maybe I say worst manifestation, in the lottery, state lottery. Uh, Las Vegas contributes its share. Uh, the racing, the races contribute their share, the track, and always just gambling, uh, where you know a whole lot of people bet their money, and a whole lot of people take their money out, and the croupier wins. The three, wins. three to twenty percent of yeah, whatever, is, whatever it is. You put a dollar in, you're um, gonna so. Uh, I'd say have a funny money if, if, if you have the gambling instinct, and most people do. At least start off. I mean, I'd say start off with an index fund, period, and for five years don't do anything else, and then look around and see what's happened in the five years. See how it felt when the market dropped fifty percent. See how it felt when it came back. <coughs> and those five-year periods are going to be very different for one investor and another. But because uh, they're all you know, over time, but uh, then when you get there, five percent in the funny money account. What would have happened to Warren Buffett if he had done that? He would have a tremendous <laughs> amount of value would not have been created by his 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 understanding and ability to evaluate a business for investment. Well, name two. <laughs> <laughs> well, Longleaf. You mentioned Longleaf, Dodge, well, and Cox. Well, they, they don't have the sensational returns. They may probably have something above par returns, but maybe a little bit below par from time to time. So, um, and then don't forget in Warren's case, he wasn't running a mutual fund. Mm -hmm. The mutual fund is a badly structured business for investment management. We say, and this is the way it has to be really, you can take your money out whenever you want, and you got to be ready to put it in whenever you want. And so you ride on these waves of optimism and good performance, and the money comes in up here, and then reversion to the mean, which is a big part of my recent book, a big part of the final chapter of my recent book called Clash of the Cultures, and it's happened everywhere. It's happened in Magellan Fund. It's happened in T. Rowe Price Growth Fund. It's happened in our old IVEST Fund. It's happened in Fidelity Trend Fund, which Ned Johnson happened to have run. It happened in CGM. All the hot funds, they were all in there for the last 25 years, and they all look like this. You lap, put them over each other, looks like the Himalaya Mountains. The reversion to the mean is a constant pattern. For the individual, um, I'm just going to poke around here a little bit just to get your full philosophy. For the individual, it's unlikely that you're going to hit the mountaintop of the Himalayas with your portfolio. So you may not have to ever see the other side of the mountaintop unless you have so successfully invested that your personal account is. Well, moving up in a, in a billion let's, dollar. Let's say you asset. bought Magellan before you, before it was for sale, which is where that record begins. By the way, there's a lot of phoniness in this business, uh, and uh, you. But you're, you're going to enjoy the mountain, mm -hmm. and you're not going to know it's a mountain. Mm -hmm. But when that mountain gets up there, you think, "My God, this! I found the holy grail." Now I'm really going to go all in. And now I'm going to go all out. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of behavioral kind of mm -hmm. stuff, not mm -hmm. to use too fancy a word, uh, in the mutual fund industry. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, Tom. There is no behavioralism in the field of stocks generally. How could that be? That is because I'm a dumb behavior. The guy that buys my stock from me is a smart behavior. We offset each other. I mean, it's not as if I, I, it's not as if I can make a behavioral mistake uh, without somebody else making a, 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 a successful behavior thing, the other side of the trade. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think we take a lot for granted. We listen to all these theories and Big, old, boring indexing is the answer. Have you ever bought individual stocks and or actively traded funds? And if so, what do you look for in those investments? Well, I, when I came into the business, I had friends in the brokerage business. I bought this and that and the other thing. And then I had a broker. And he would tell me this was good, get out of that and get into that. 
And it wasn't that they did badly, which was, of course, what they did. But it was, I just couldn't stand to have my phone ring when I was trying to do my work. So I haven't owned an individual stock since, let me say, 1960. I don't know exactly, a long, long time. All right, last question, three pieces of advice to entrepreneurs. What are your three pieces? I'm an entrepreneur, so you can share them with me. Okay. What would you, what would you, how would you advise me? Well, um, I, first of all, I really need to give some thought to like, how can I provide advice that would be most helpful? And I'm not sure I've given enough thought to, to, to that, to give you the best possible answer. But I think, um, I think certainly uh, being focused on something that you're confident will have high value to someone else um, and just being really rigorous in making that assessment um, mm -hmm. because people are, tend, tend to, a natural human tendency is wishful thinking. Um, mm -hmm. So a, a challenge for entrepreneurs is to say, well, what's the difference between really believing in your ideals and sticking, sticking to them versus pursuing some unrealistic dream that right. doesn't actually have merit? And it's it's that is a it, that is a really difficult thing to to tell. You, can you tell the difference between those two things? Right. You know? So you need to be sort of very rigorous um, in in your self uh, self analysis. Um, I think certainly extremely tenacious, uh, and um, and then just work like hell. I mean, you just have to put in you know eighty hour, eighty to one hundred hour weeks every week. Yes. And That's then. A lot of work. That, that, that all those things improve the odds of success. Okay. Um, right. I mean, if, 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 if other people are putting in 40-hour work weeks and you're putting in 100-hour work weeks, then even if uh, you're doing the same thing, you know that in, in one year you will achieve what they achieve. You, you, you will achieve in four months what it takes them a year to achieve. Okay. I like your work ethic. All right. Thanks, Thanks. Elon. We have to deal in things that we're capable of understanding. And then once we're over that filter, we have to have a business with some intrinsic characteristics that give it a durable competitive advantage. And then of course, we would vastly prefer a management in place with a lot of integrity and talent. And finally, no matter how wonderful it is, it's not worth an infinite price. So we have to have a price that makes sense and gives a margin of safety considering the natural vicissitudes of life. That's a very simple set of ideas. And the reason that our ideas have not spread faster is they're too simple. The professional classes can't justify their existence if that's all they have to say. I mean, it's all so obvious and so simple. What would they have to do with the rest of the semester? Words of wisdom from a man that has been investing since the 1960s. Almost 60 years of that as Warren Buffett's investing partner. He is right to say that investing is simple with his years of experience. And if you want to learn more, please subscribe and check out our explanation of Munger's checklist. Go through that strategy and go through uh, how it works and when you come, you know, maybe you'll override that portfolio manager or not, but what, what's the checklist you kind of go through? Uh, so we look for very high quality businesses, uh, what we describe as simple, predictable, free cash flow generative, dominant businesses, a, a business that Warren Buffett would describe as having a moat around it, right? If you, if you believe that the value of anything, financial, is the present value of the cash you can take out of it over its life, we well, need to know what, how much cash is going to generate over its life. So, the, so business quality to us is the single most important uh, criterion for determining what's interesting. Because if, if we can't predict the cash flows, we don't know what it's worth. If we don't know what it's worth, we can't invest. So we figure out what it's worth, we figure out how good the business is, how predictable will this cash flows be from a railroad or a spirits company or a real estate company, a shopping mall business. Uh, and then we say, uh, okay, well, where's the trading? Um, and if there's a wide gap between price and value, uh, you can buy for 50 cents, it's worth $1.20, and then we're going to take a hard look and try to understand why it trades at a deep discount. And uh, 
once we understand the reasons, we decide, well, these things that we can solve. You know, or can we, in light of the situation, uh, the circumstances, can we be influential in changing these, these levers that can cause this valuation discrepancy to narrow? And is this a business that, while we're causing the valuation discrepancy to narrow, we can also perhaps contribute to the valuation growing? Uh, if those things are true, we found something that looks quite interesting for us. And um, usually this investment philosophy, does it take a week, a month, three months to do the research, a year? I mean, you have ten names. What, how long? It depends. I mean, one of the best investments we ever made uh, took us four hours to do the work. Uh, it was during the financial crisis. Which was that? Uh, Wachovia Corporation. Okay. So um, I was on my Blackberry uh, eating breakfast uh, at the Brooklyn Diner uh, in front of my building, and the story went across the, uh, I was just in a, re in a Wall Street Journal headline, a Reuters headline, excuse me, uh, went across saying, um, that Citigroup uh, to acquire the Wachovia banking subsidiaries for two dollars in Citigroup stock. Stock was halted. And this was kind of an interesting transaction because they were buying the subsidiaries for Citigroup stock. I figured, hmm, that's interesting. What happens to the holding company? So I went back to the, you know, kind of went upstairs to the office and, you know, cracked open the 10K and, and uh, another member of the team, Mick McGuire, uh, uh, he and I worked on it. And uh, what was interesting is the thousand page 10K of Wachovia Corporation, I think 900 pages were on the banking subsidiary. There was fewer than 100 pages on the holding company. And by buying the banking subsidiary, Citi was leaving a holding company which had cash, um, you know, in Wachovia Securities, uh, A.G. Edwards, they had paid six, seven billion for it six months before, um, Evergreen Asset Management, and they were taking a $27 billion uh, loss on the sale of the subsidiary. And uh, it, it also had a liability called non-cumulative perpetual preferred stock. Which, if you ever want to have a liability in your life, this is the single greatest uh, liability to have. It's a, it's a form of equity where you never have to pay a dividend, and when you don't pay them, they don't accumulate. And the worst case is they get a couple directors on the board, and you say hi to them each meeting, and uh, you have this very. You know, I said, look, this could be the, our, our Berkshire Hathaway. And uh, at the end of the day, we figured the asset. You know, in four hours, we determined the holding company was worth at least 11 to 14 dollars cash, a tax refund that you could, you know, you could carry back the 27 billion dollar. Uh, loss, recover cash taxes that have been paid. So you have this cash vehicle, you know, Wachovia Securities, which is a you know, good wealth management business. Mm -hmm. You know, and A.G. Edwards, another interesting yeah. uh, asset. You, these are businesses you know well. And uh, the stock opened after it was halted at $1.84. So we said, look, it's worth you know, 11 to 14, $1.84. We bought 42% of the volume for the next four days. And then it was acquired by, then Wells came in and put in a topping bid of $7 in Wells Fargo stock, which wasn't actually a topping bid. But the Wells Fargo deal did not require government assistance. Right. So I think Sheila Bear liked that. Yep, I remember that. Liked we, that I actually better. interviewed Sheila Bear sure. for our show. Your stock is actually up 70% this year. Um, is there one thing that you think is responsible for that? Or several things? Because 70% is pretty good. No, I, um, it's a, you know, I, uh, I have been lecturing, we have all hands meetings at Amazon and for 20 years, ever since we've been probably 21 years now, 1997, um, every, at almost every all hands meeting, I say, look, when the stock is up 30% in a month, don't feel 30% smarter. Because when the stock is down 30% in a month, it's not gonna feel so good to be, feel 30% dumber. And uh, that's what happens. Uh, never spend any time thinking about the daily stock price. I don't. Okay, so as a result of going up 70% this year, you have become the wealthiest man in the world. It, is that a title that you really wanted or not? I, is it a I can burden? assure you I have never sought that title. And um, uh, it was fine being the second wealthiest person in the world. That actually worked fine. Um, it's not, it, it isn't a, um, it, I, I would say pe it's something people naturally are curious about. You know, it's a kind of an interesting curiosity, but it's not the thing. I would much rather if they said like, um, you know, inventor Jeff Bezos or entrepreneur Jeff Bezos or, uh, you know, father Jeff Bezos. Those kinds of things are much more meaningful to me. And uh, the, you know, the, it's an output measure. The, if you look at the financial success of Amazon and the, the stock, I own 16% of Amazon. Um, Amazon's worth roughly a trillion dollars. That means that what we have built over 20 years, we have built $840 billion of wealth for other people. And that's great. That's how it should be. You know, 
there, I believe so powerfully in uh, the ability of entrepreneurial capitalism and free markets to solve so many of the world's problems. Not all of them, but so many of them. So um, you live in uh, Washington State, near in Seattle, yeah. or outside of Seattle. Now, the man who was the richest man for about 20 years is named Bill Gates. Yeah. And um, what is the likelihood that the two richest men in the world live not only in the same country, not only in the same state, not only in the same city, but in the same neighborhood? I mean, is there something in that neighborhood that we should know about? And are there any, are there any more houses for sale there? After I, after I saw uh, Bill uh, uh, not, not too long ago, um, I, you know, we were joking about the world's richest man thing, and I, I basically said, thank you know, I said, you're welcome. And he immediately turned to me and said, thank you. Um, but no, Medina is a great little, uh, it's a suburb of Seattle, and you know, I don't think there's anything special in the water there. And right. you know, I did locate Amazon in Seattle because of Microsoft. I thought that that big pool of technical talent would provide a good place to recruit talented people from, and that did turn out right. to be true. So it's not a complete coincidence. Let's talk about money. Men and women have been concerned about money since the first coin was fashioned in Asia Minor about 700 BC. You might say that money's like good health in that we're concerned about it to the extent that we don't have it. The purpose of this message is to get down to basics, to clear the air surrounding the entire subject of money. To do this, I'm going to have to get absolutely elementary, and while you may already know most of the things I'm going to say, I think it's important that we remind ourselves just exactly what money is, how much of it is enough, and how to earn the amount of money you need to live the way you want to live, now and in the important future years. To begin, let's get rid of the old myth once and for all that money is bad or unimportant. It is not bad, and it is important, vitally important. It's just as important as the food and clothes it buys, the shelter it affords, the education it provides, and the doctor's bills it pays. Money is important to any person living in a civilized society. To argue and split hairs to the effect that it's not as important as other things is absurd. Nothing will take the place of money in the area in which money works. That's all there is to it. What is money? Money is the harvest of our production. Money is what we receive for our production and service as persons, and which we can then use to obtain the production and service of others. We can quite often accurately gauge the extent of our production and service by simply counting the amount of money we receive for it. You will still hear people say, money won't bring happiness. The earning and possession of money has brought a lot more happiness than has poverty. Money is a warm home and healthy children. It's birthday presents and a college education. It's a trip abroad and the means to help the older people and the less fortunate. We're not saying that piling up a lot of wealth is important. What we are saying is that money is important because it's the only reward which is completely negotiable and can be used by everyone. Look at it this way. A diamond is more valuable than a lump of coal, yet that's exactly what a diamond was at one time. And just as a lump of coal can be transformed into one of the world's most valuable objects, a human being can vastly increase his own value to the world. Try to remember this formula. The amount of money we receive will always be in direct ratio to the demand for what we do, our ability to do it, and the difficulty of replacing us. A highly skilled human being is worth more money in our economy than a person who is not highly skilled and who can be easily replaced. This is not to say that one person is any better than any other person. Remember that in this message we're only talking about money, nothing else. This is why there are few limitations on a person within his company and industry. His income will be an exact proportion to the demand for what he does, his ability to do what he does, and the difficulty of replacing him. That's why the whole idea of trying to get something for nothing is ridiculous and won't work. A top jockey will earn upwards of $200,000 a year, which will represent 10% of the winnings of the horses he rides. You might say riding a horse serves no useful purpose. But the demand is there, useful or not. It's the same with a star in show business. His or her income will very accurately reflect the demand for what he or she does. And that's why preparation for life is so important. Luck has been defined as what happens when preparedness meets opportunity. A great opportunity will only make the unprepared, the unqualified, 
appear ridiculous. For every one of us, opportunities are all around us. Our ability to see them will depend in large part on how well we have prepared ourselves. Now, how do you stack up in this regard? Now, while this may sound elementary, you'd be amazed at the number of people who want more money, but don't want to take the time and trouble to qualify for it. And until they qualify for it, there's no way on earth for them to earn it. It's like the person who wants a good-looking figure but doesn't want to stay on a diet long enough to get it. To nine-tenths of the world's population, the average North American is already rich. There's a greater difference between the standard of living of most of the world's population and our average worker than there is between the standard enjoyed by our average worker and the richest man in the country. Our working man has just about everything the wealthiest man has, only smaller. He has a home, car, often two of them, radio, TV, savings account, debts, they're just smaller. His food is as good and just as plentiful. His bed is just as comfortable. His home is just as warm in the winter. He has exactly the same amount of time and just as much, maybe more, freedom. His life expectancy at birth is 70 years. For the rest of the world, on the average, it's less than 40. With only a fraction of the world's population, we in the free world have half of the world's total money income. We have more than two-thirds of all the automobiles on Earth. So in talking about money, let's understand that we're already rich as people. Now, how much do you want? How much money do you need to live the way you want to live to accomplish the goals you have established for yourself? Most people think they want more money than they really do, and settle for a lot less than they could earn if they went about it the right way. The world will pay you exactly what you bargained for, exactly what you earned, but not a penny more. You remember the poem that goes, I bargained with life for a penny, and life would pay no more? Well, that's about it. We will receive not what we idly wish for, but what we justly earn. Our rewards will always be in exact proportion to our service. If you don't like your income, you must devise ways and means of increasing your service. And this is an individual thing. No one can do it for you. Although you can get ideas from others, your service must come out of you, your mind, your abilities, and your energy. A strong man cannot make a weak man strong. But a weak man can become strong on his own by following a specific course of action for a sufficient length of time. And a man who's already strong can become a lot stronger. It's the same with this business of money. A man who refuses to do more than he's being paid for will seldom be paid for more than he's doing. You may have heard someone say, why should I knock myself out for the money I'm getting? Now it's this attitude which, more than anything else, keeps a person at the bottom of the economic pile. He doesn't understand that only as we grow in value as persons will we receive the increased income we seek. If we try to stand still in our work, and millions do, We'll never know the rewards, nor the joy of accomplishment, and their personal satisfaction and peace of mind, which come only to the person of unusual achievement. There are two distinct steps we must take. First, we must decide how much money we really want. Once this decision is made, the second step is to forget the money and concentrate on improving what we now do until we've grown to the size that will fit and naturally earn the income we seek. Once we're fully qualified for the amount of money we decide to earn, we'll soon find ourselves earning it. And we'll also discover that with our new powers and abilities, it's no more difficult, perhaps even less difficult, than what we're now doing for the money we're now earning. Now ask yourself, how much money am I perfectly willing to earn, realizing that the amount I earn will be in exact proportion to my skills, the demand for what I do, and the difficulty of replacing me? There are really three amounts of money every person should decide upon. One, the yearly income he wants to earn now or in the near future. Two, the amount of money he wants to have in a savings and or investment account. And three, the amount of money he wants as retirement income, whether he ever retires from active work or not. Now it's here that most people make a very serious mistake. They never decide on any one of these three amounts of money. If you will decide on these three amounts, and if you will write them on a card to carry with you or put someplace where you can review it from time to time, you will automatically have placed yourself in the top 5% of the people. You will have a plan for your future, a blueprint for future financial accomplishment. 
You'll know where you're going, and if you're serious about it, you will most certainly get there. You see, the trouble with people is not in achieving their goals. They can do that. It's in not setting goals that people get in trouble. They leave it to chance and find out sooner or later, and to their sorrow, that chance doesn't work, that they've missed the boat. It's estimated that only 5% decide on the money they'll earn and then grow as persons into the size of the incomes they seek. They thus take their lives, their fortunes, and their futures into their own hands as they should and accomplish their goals right on schedule all the years of their lives. You can do the same thing, and you can do it starting right now. There are two kinds of people where money's concerned. There are the majority who cut back on their wants to fit their incomes, and there are those free spirits in the minority who make their incomes fit their wants. Now, which is best for you? You must decide. Ben Franklin gave us the secret to wealth. He said the road to wealth lies in augmenting our means or diminishing our wants. Either will do. But the quickest way to wealth is to do both at the same time. Now, when you write down the yearly income you mean to earn, you no doubt know whether or not it's average for the work you're in or above average. The chances are good that the figure you'll decide upon will be above average, perhaps quite a bit above average. That's good. Now ask yourself, who in my line of work is now earning that kind of money? If you know, you'll have a good idea of what you have to do in order to earn it. Now this is exactly how men move from the ranks into positions of top authority with corresponding incomes. I have no way of knowing your line of business. Regardless of the business you're in, it needs new leaders, men to come up in the years ahead. Everything is expanding, getting larger, and with the increase in size and scope, the most desperate need is for the dedicated, able person who can learn to lead, to lead the field, and to lead others as well. Some of the top executives in the nation today were once accountants, shipping clerks, struggling lawyers, service station attendants, salesmen far out in remote territories, sales clerks, mailroom boys, mechanics. You cannot think of a position from which people have not climbed to the top. Understand what I'm going to say, and it'll bring you and yours everything you want. It's not the job, it's the person. It's not your present circumstances which count, but the circumstances you make up your mind to achieve that are important. The only limit on your income is you. And the income you decide upon can be achieved within the framework of your present work, industry, or profession, where you already have a start and a place. All you need is the plan, the road map, and the courage to press on to your destination knowing in advance that there will be problems and setbacks, but knowing also that nothing on earth can stand in the way of a plan backed by persistence and determination. With the income written down that you intend to earn, spend a part of each day thinking of ways in which you can increase your service, knowing that you have only to manage this and the income will take care of itself. Since the amount of money you want to earn is more than you're now receiving, your part of the bargain is to find ways of increasing your service until the gap has been bridged and more than bridged. Look at your card with the three amounts written on it. By setting a financial goal, you're demonstrating faith. You will find that you'll begin to become what others call lucky. You'll begin to get good hunches and ideas. You'll take far more interest in everything about your work and your company. You'll see opportunities in your work and environment you've never noticed before. In fact, you'll soon discover you're no longer the same person. You'll care less how others are doing their jobs and concern yourself more with the manner in which you do yours. By your example, you'll inspire others to do their jobs better. Have faith in yourself and the quiet, firm inner knowledge that you can and will accomplish your goals. Know that the answers you seek will come to you in their own time if you only keep looking for them. Above all, realize that money cannot be sought directly. Money, like happiness, is an effect. It's the result of a cause, and the cause is valuable service. Keep money in its proper place. It's a servant, nothing more. It's a tool with which we can live better, see more of the world, give our youngsters the education they need and a good start in life. It's the means to a happy, carefree retirement in later years. Money is necessary to modern life, but keep it in its place. You need only so much food to enjoy good health. You need only so much money to live comfortably, securely, and well. Too much emphasis on money reverses the whole picture. You then become the servant, and the money becomes the master. As Horace Latimer put it, it's good to have money and the things money can buy, but it's good, too, to check up once in a while and make sure that you haven't lost the things that money can't buy. 
every person should know happiness in his work and home and prosperity. These things can and should be yours. Now, play this message as often as you can during the next week. Fix your plans firmly in your mind and relax. Keep cool and calm. Be as serene as you possibly can be. You have nothing to worry about. Right now, you may have no idea at all how the additional income you seek is going to come to you, nor how you're going to save the amount you want in a savings account, or how you can possibly arrange for the retirement income you've decided upon. That isn't important. Remember that the only really important thing is that you know what you want. If you do, you will become, you must become what you think about. Be realistic about your financial goals, for as you reach them, you can then set higher goals. Trying to jump too far too soon can often result in confusion, tenseness, and worry. Take your growth in sensible, logical steps, remembering that the big thing is that you know what you want and that you realize your rewards will match your service. That is, that you must devise ways and means of actually becoming the person who is worth the amount of money you have established for yourself. A person may be worth more than he's getting for a while, but the two will match up. They have to. In fact, unless a person is worth more than he's now receiving, he cannot move ahead. He's receiving all he's worth. It all gets back to the great law that controls everything in the universe, cause and effect. The cause must precede the effect, or the effect cannot occur. This is why people who try to get something for nothing are only fooling themselves and earning the disillusionment and frustration they must one day reap. You can have what you want. You need only make up your mind.